Well, hey, Vision. Hey, Mike. Okay, we are in part three of our series called Farm Grown Faith. I've been looking forward to this series all year, and God has been stretching us and teaching us. And let me kind of give you a recap. Because in week one, we talked about this concept of sowing and reaping. And we, we discussed that this thing that Jesus talked about, this concept, it's not just for Christians or Christ followers. This is truly a law that all of us can understand in life, that the things we sow into, that is what we're going to reap in our relationships, in our finances, in our health, in our education, our careers. So this is a logical thing that what we sow into is what we're going to reap. So Jesus, he took this concept and he said, make sure you guys understand that your lives are based on the things you sow into. That's what you're going to reap. And he said, I'm going to teach you about soils. Let's talk about in week two. We talked in there about seed falling on the path and getting snatched up, seed falling into rocky ground and not having enough uh, depth to it to, to grow roots. We talked about that um, the, these weeds come up in our lives and choke us, or even rocks. Remember we talked last week about tilling the soil and getting these rocks out? Or having good soil that when God's word is planted in it, it grows and flourishes even a hundredfold. Remember I talked about apples and how you plant a seed, and it doesn't just produce a hundred apples, it produces apples for generations. And we want to see that. Remember week one, we talked about jars. I had a bunch of jars up here, and we said that story of a Elisha and a woman with jars, and her faith was to go get so many jars, and literally God's power filled those jars until the jars were done. And if she'd have had more jars, if she'd have pulled in a tanker truck, God would have filled it. And I'm telling you, if you understand this concept of sowing and reaping, you will see God work in incredible ways beyond what you can manufacture. So today, we're talking about crop failure. Now, okay, any, and anybody here grow stuff? I know, like Mike was showing me pictures of his stuff. You, you, you understand. If you put something in the ground and you're like, hey, why, why is it not coming up? What, what's wrong with this? Why did I not get a harvest? Now, next week, we're to wrap up the series talking about harvest. But today, I want us to talk about a reality in our lives of crop failure, that you want to see truly a reaping from your sowing, whether it's from God's word in your life, that's part of this, but honestly, in relationships. You say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sow into this relationship. Why, why are things not happening? I'm trying to get my, fa fi my finances right. I'm sowing in. Why is there failure in this? I'm trying to get healthy. I'm trying to do the right things to be healthy. What's wrong in this? And it's the concept of crop failure. What happens in our lives when the crop is not coming in. Now, to help us understand this, I want to use one of my favorite props, and it usually it does connect with people well, so I, I like M&M's. Now, anybody here like M&M's? Okay, I definitely like M&M's. Now, I've been on this project, okay, this, this Lose to Win project, Project 199, so I've been, I've been sparingly enjoying M&M's. What I've been trying to do is just, like, smell them, but not eat them as often, and that doesn't have any calories, I don't think, right? Now, okay, let me see this. Uh, Raleigh, do you like M&M's? Okay, would you come help me something then? Come up here, come here. All right, cause so, so Raleigh, come stand up here. And, and Raleigh, what I'm going to do is we're going to talk about M&M's, and then you're going to help me with M&M's today, because you like M&M's? So smell that. Is that like genuine M&M's smell in there? Okay. All right, so let's say, you know, I, got, I got some M&M's here. I don't know, say like four or five packs there. And I'm, I'm telling you guys about the M&M's, and I'm keeping an eye on her, make sure she's not like stealing my M&M's, because we can't have you stealing, certainly not in church, from the pastor. Don't, don't steal any M&M's. Because these M&Ms are going to be kind of symbolic of seed that's cast and then truly about a harvest that comes in. So, okay, so I'm going to start off with is giving you a pack of M&Ms because you like M&Ms, right? You would love to like tear open those M&Ms, start eating those M&Ms. So let's do this. You're going to take those with you and we're going to dialogue a little bit during, during the, the conversation, during the message today about M&Ms. But why don't you take those with you? Those are yours. You're going to step on down. And actually, as you take them, Raleigh, give them away to somebody you don't know. Or something like, not your family right here. Give, give them away to somebody. Because those M&Ms are kind of symbolic. There you go. Look at that. You're, you're already gaining from being here today. A pack of M&Ms. Now, with Raleigh, I wonder if she's in a spot where, as I walk through our four points today, she's in this first spot of crop failure that we call uh, lack of belief or lack of faith. Because she's saying, hey, Pastor Matt, I, I thought you were giving me M&Ms. Yeah, I thought I was going to get to enjoy M&M's. I mean, I got to smell the M&M's, hold the M&M's, feel the M&M's. I just about opened up to eat M&M's, but you made me give them away. So as I talk today about four different points of crop failure, at the very least, you're going to go to work tomorrow or school tomorrow and say, hey, 
Pastor Matt was talking something about M&M's. How can I remember crop failure with M&M's? Here's how we do it. The first one is lack of faith. Now, Jesus, when he was talking to people and teaching people, he astonished them. I mean, literally, it says in the Bible, his teaching amazed people or astonished people. So let's take a look at this one short story in Matthew 13. It says, when Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Like we've been talking for a couple weeks, the teachings of Jesus are amazing. They're much more than I or you can manufacture, but Jesus would teach with a depth to them. The people would say, man, there's something to that. This guy, Jesus, is teaching words that really matter and really last. They are amazed, but then there's a shift in this. It says, where did this man get wisdom get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked. So I, I think there's almost like a curiosity of like, okay, this guy, he's, he's teaching something with death. Remember last week when he was teaching about the four soils? I think people are like, wow, there's, there's something to this. This guy really has something. But look, there's, there's this subtle shift in here where it says, hey, isn't this the, the carpenter's son? Because these guys, they knew him. He was teaching in his hometown. And then he starts shifting more. And they're like, isn't his mother's name Mary? And hadn't he got brothers? I mean, he's just a man. He's got these brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. Aren't his sisters with us? Where, where did this man get all these things? Hey, actually, we take offense to him. What, what's he thinking? He's better than us. He's teaching us stuff. You, you see this shift from like brilliance to some type of pride getting in here? Some, some, the reality is it's unbelief because it says, Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town and his own home. And, and think about this. The man of all time who could do miracles was teaching these people, and their, their perspective of him shifted to where now it says he, he couldn't do any miracles in that town. Like, literally, there was a blocker. Literally, there was a ceiling that he couldn't work in the life of somebody who had unbelief. Literally, like Raleigh walking away saying, Pastor Matt, talk to the hand because you gave me some M&Ms and you took them away. You said you're going to bless me, because I'm telling you, I'm going to bless you with M&Ms. you got to trust me in that. But if you have lack of faith, lack of belief, it's literally a blocker, and it's going to move you toward what we call crop failure. That if Raleigh is believing for a crop, just like these people, like us, would believe for a crop, when you hear God's word, it gets in you. Remember we talked last week about the soil that's tilled, the rocks are out of it, the weeds are cleared, you put that seed in there, there will be a crop, but these people are doing something that is limiting Jesus' ability. You imagine if you spent time on this planet in the presence of Jesus Christ and he couldn't do any miracles because of your unbelief? Oh, man, I don't want that in my life. When I think about wanting God to work in my life in this whole concept of sowing and reaping, I want him to build my faith. In fact, these last couple of months, he's been challenging it. He's like, Matt, can, can, can you move? Matt, can you, can you let go of some things? Matt, can you trust where I'm taking you? And he's saying that to all of us in any area of our life where we're sowing and wanting to reap, and Jesus is saying, will you trust me? And that's a tough question. So I got a couple steps for us of this. Some steps, because if you're like me, when you get in a spot where things aren't necessarily working, you work harder. When things aren't coming together, you put in more time. You try to put your hands on it more and say, okay, well, if it's, if it's meant to be, then it's up to me. I'm going to do that. Well, actually, then to me, one of our next steps is to observe the Sabbath. You're like, what? Observe the Sabbath? What's that about? This feeds into any of us that even tend to be workaholics, that tend to be control freaks, that tend to be people who said, really, if it's going to happen, I'm going to have to do it myself because evidently God doesn't have what I need and the time I need and the way I need. I'm going to have to make it happen. And so it's kind of like Raleigh walking back to her seat saying, hey, no M&Ms. Wh where's Pastor Matt at? Where, where's his promise? I, I want to tell you that Jesus, he speaks to you. He sends you promises. And he says, if you have belief, I can work in that. And if you have a lack of faith, you're tying my hands. Okay, another next step is to carve out time with God. Because again, if you're in a spot where you need to make things happen, if anything, you're too busy to spend time with God. You're too busy to stop and read or stop and pray or stop and have a spiritual conversation. And God's saying, carve out some time with me. Observe that Sabbath. Carve out time. But really, the biggest one, next step in this is to cast seed in new faith-filled ways. 
And this has been a challenge for me because as I think about us moving and we're heading toward this project, remember a couple, about a month ago, we had a single mom with a need, we cast seed there. We had a spanky over in Uganda, we cast seed there. And I'm like, God, we need to start aligning ourselves for that new campus. And God said, no, 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 no. You need to cast seed in new faith-filled ways. You need to cast it somewhere else where you get no direct benefit. So I want to challenge you. In whatever area of your life you are wanting to see God work, like literally you're sowing into it, and you say, I'm going to reap something there. I'm going to reap something there. You need to focus on your faith growing and not diminishing by you putting your hands on things, controlling things. Because when you release that, and God says you're casting seed in new faith-filled ways, he said, I could work in that. Okay, so the second, the second thing is impatience. Now, I got these M&Ms. And I'm loving how they smell. So, so, Riley, I know you've been waiting. So why don't you come here? Because I know you've been waiting. You're like, yes, now is the time. You can, you can come right here. Let's get some M&Ms. So why don't you take those M&Ms and, well, no, don't eat those M&Ms. Pass them out to people. Give them away right now. Just walk around there and pass them out. Because here, Riley was sitting there like, come on, you know, I know I'm going to get M&Ms. I know there's going to be a blessing in this somehow. I know it's going to happen. And she's like, Dad, Mom, I'm, I'm going to get M&Ms. And then when I say, okay, Riley, come here. I got a bag full of M&M's. She's like, it's time. And how many times does God say to you, no, it's not, it's not time yet. It's not time yet. And me and my wife, Meg, what we call this is stock time. Like, look, I got this picture of this sunflower. You know, a sunflower, it starts, you know, down on the ground, and it starts growing, and that sunflower pops out right here, right? And you're like, no, no, it doesn't. It doesn't do that. That stalk, it grows, and it grows, and it grows. And it grows, and there's waiting, and there's waiting, and there's waiting until it's time. So I want to encourage you. If, you. if you happen to be impatient or even know somebody who's impatient, this is for you. Because we want to see God work on our timing. We want to see God work now. In fact, we want to see him work last week. And if he hasn't worked yet, then surely he's not going to come through. I mean, surely he's, he's, he's forgot about me. He's forgot about my need, the thing I'm praying for, the thing I've sowed into. And next thing we know, we're looking in the mirror and we're seeing a person who's impatient. Does anybody in here deal with impatience at all? Okay, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, because I, mean, I, I want to make it happen. I want to see it happen. And it's kind of like with Raleigh right here. I said, okay, it's time for chocolate. She's like, yeah. I said, but it's just not time for your chocolate yet. And she passed it out. And it's symbolic to us of when God comes to us and says, look, I'm, I'm trying to grow you. I'm trying to do something in you. You're, you're not ready for it yet. And we say, yes, we are. I am ready, God. He says, actually, you're not. That in Galatians 6, 9, it says, let us not become weary. So say weary. weary. Okay, is anybody here feeling weary at all? Because I saw some people walking in today and you're like, duh, duh. I've been moving stuff. I've been doing stuff. I had a second job. I had whatever. We're used to weariness in our energy. Are you used to weariness in your emotions? Are you used to weariness in, in your mental when you're like, God, I've been sowing. I've been sowing in that relationship. I've been sowing into it. Where's the change? Where's the help? You're sowing in your finances and God, we're trying to get it lined up. God, I'm trying to get out of debt. God, I'm trying to get where I don't stress about money. I'm weary. I'm weary. God, I'm so tired of this. And God says, hey, it's, it's stock time. This is the time when I'm growing that stock. It's not time yet for harvest. Don't give up. It says, if, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, and I trust you, this isn't our time. This is God knowing what the proper time is. We will reap a harvest. So say harvest. harvest. Is anybody excited about harvest? When you think about the things you're sowing into, and you're sowing into something, you're sowing into your health, Tasha, we're, we're sowing to our health. Hey, we're trying to exercise, right? We're trying to, to feel healthier. And we're saying, okay, God, I want to reap a harvest. I want to be healthier. I want more energy. I, I, want, to, I want to feel better. And this verse is saying you're going to reap a harvest if you don't give up. So same thing with Raleigh. Like I'm speaking to you, my friend. Like don't give up. Because Raleigh can be like, Dad, what's up with this? Pa Pastor Matt, he's like playing with me on this. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm heading back. I'm, give me the keys. I'm going to get the car. I don't even drive yet, but I'm out of here. And Riley's like, ugh. Because, you know, patience, it gets into us. It makes us do crazy things. I want to promise you, in this spiritual battle you're in, impatience is how the evil one tries to creep in there. Say, so just give up. God doesn't care about you. 
God, God doesn't even know what's going on in you. You're so messed up. God couldn't work in you or through you. And sometimes we hear those lies and they sound so real. And remember last week we talked about this, uh, this concept of going to, to dig up your seed. I mean, I don't know if, if Mike ever went out to his tomato plants or pepper plants. He's like, I don't see it coming out yet. Let, let me dig it up and see. Okay, let me plant it back again. And tomorrow let me dig it up and see. I mean, are you going to have much success there, Mike? You're not going to. Because you have to be patient so that the proper time the harvest will come. But that's hard for us. But what's so important in this is that we help each other with it, that we get some perspective from friends. We talk to each other and say, hey, just be patient. God's working. Because a year ago, I went through something and God did it. And, he, and you hear that and you're like, wow, okay, that encourages me. And we encourage each other on that journey of waiting. So some of our next steps in this is to be honest and to talk with God about your impatience. I'm like, oh, man, I don't want to talk about that. That's, that's so uncomfortable. I mean, that's so, like, revealing. Hey, look, God knows it. Probably people in your house know it. Some of the people in your life know it. So why don't you be real and sit down with God and say, God, let's, let's, let me talk about this impatience. Because a lot of times, impatience, honestly, it comes back to either a selfishness issue or a, a pride issue, a control issue. And I need to sit there and say, God, I'm not waiting on your timing because... And God says, okay, now we're making some progress. And the second next step, and you're not going to like this one, pray for patience. Okay, okay. Has anybody here ever prayed for patience before? And you're like, no, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> not do that again. Uh-uh. No, no, no. Okay, let, let, me, let, me, let me show you something here that, that I feel like I've observed in 30-ish years of walking with God. There's, there's kind of two different things about, about this. Number one, because people, I even heard this, somebody said this this week to me. He said, man, I am never praying for patience again because I went through the toughest things. No, no, no. I think that happens when you say, God, teach me patience. Because if you're being real on this journey and you want to grow in patience, you'll say, God, teach me patience. He will put you in situations that will challenge your patience. Amen. Now, if you say, God, I want to pray for patience in me. I mean, literally, the fruit of the Spirit that is patience, that is an active prayer saying, God, change me to where this week when something happens, instead of me flying off, I realize I handled it a little bit better. That is patience growing in you. You want to pray for that. Trust me in that. So in this area, in this stock time, you stop and you pray and say, God, I admit to you, I'm impatient. I admit to you, God, I don't see how you're working. You're not working fast enough. I got, God, where, where's my chocolate? Like, where is it? And instead of Raleigh sitting there making notes saying, like, I'm going to write a mean connection card about Pastor Matt. So then she's like, no, I'm going to trust I'm going to trust that Pastor Matt is teaching me something. I'm going to trust there is something better on the end of this, in this stock time. I'm going to pray for patience because I'm telling you, God will honor that prayer. He will. Now, the third part of this crop failure, and honestly, you're not like this one either, is unconfessed sin. Unconfessed sin. And everybody right now is like, okay, I definitely don't want to talk on microphone or put up on screen my unconfessed sins. I don't want that. Don't worry, you're safe. You're safe, but God knows, and God knows mine. So when I think about, literally, sin in my life, something that is damaging my relationship with God, it is not confessed. Let's see what the Word says about it. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, so say confess. Because you understand what confession is. Confession is verbalizing what that sin is. And most people are like, uh-uh, I don't want to do that. You don't have to do it right now, but you have to do it. And when you do, it says he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Okay, say purify. 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 Let's, think about, let's think about a relationship here. Let's say like me and Scott right here, we got a friendship. we got a relationship. If things come into our relationship that cause pain or marks on that, then we are not in a righteous, I'm not in a right standing with Scott because of something that has come up in our relationship. So if I say, okay, Scott, man, the other day... Yeah, I did kind of say something mean to Meredith because, well, she kind of deserved it. No, but no, she, she, but whatever my perspective was, I did something against his wife, and Scott's like, I can be Mr. Nice Guy, but right now, Matt, we got issues in our relationship. That means that we are not, I'm not in right standing, so literally, I need to purify that relationship. Say, Scott, I'm sorry. Can you forgive me for what I did, what I said, and we fix that? 
That comes from the confessing of that sin to bring me back into right standing with him. It's the same thing with your heavenly father. Stuff all the time coming our way that is going to try to drag us into sin. We say, no, no, no. God, I, 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 my temper, no, 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 oh, my selfishness, oh, my pride. God, let me talk to you about that. Confess it so that I'm in right standing with you. Our relationship is healthier and it's not causing crop failure because of unconfessed sin. Another verse on this from Proverbs 28, 13, it says, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper. Okay, so say prosper. prosper. I mean, like you want to prosper, say prosper. prosper. Okay, because I want to prosper. Because remember, for months now, we've been talking about Deuteronomy 28, which says, if you obey God and his commands, you will have abundant prosperity. I want abundant prosperity. I want to feel that in my relationships. I want that in my finances. I want that in my mental health. So I want to prosper, but it says, if I conceal my sin, I will not prosper. Because the reality is the sin's there. God knows about it. But when I confess it and lay it out there, I have not concealed it anymore. That opens the doors to prosper and moves me past crop failure. It says the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. And that ties into Isaiah 59. It says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities or your sins have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So literally, you're in your time with God. You're like, God, I want to hear you. God, I need direction in this. God, help me in this. And God's like, I I can't communicate with you right now about that because you have unconfessed sin. So some next steps in this. They're hard steps. But if you want to grow in your walk during the stalk time, first thing you do is you identify sin in your life. Now, if you're having a hard time identifying it, man, just go talk to somebody who knows you. Okay? (laughs) Okay. If I'm like, God, I don't know where I'm sinning. God's like, go talk to Meg. Okay. Go talk to your kids. Okay. Man, go talk to your friend John. John's like, Matt, <laughs> I've been waiting for months, man. Let me tell you. <laughs> okay. Identify sin in your life. And we laugh about it, but this, this is a very serious and character-shaping opportunity. If you want to grow in your walk with the Lord, you'll identify sin in your life. Like, okay, good start. But the next steps to it of confessing it, I'm literally saying again, Scott, I've identified what I did. I'm confessing what I did. But even that's not enough because what if I confess that and then tomorrow I did the same thing? I saw Meredith get around town. I'm like, and Scott's like, where's the change? That's where repentance comes in. You identify it, you confess it, and repentance is literally turning from that sin and saying, God, I don't want to do it anymore. I see that what that's doing in relationships. I see what that's doing with my relationship with you. I want to change from that. I want to turn from that. That's repentance. And I'll see an American church today, a lot of people don't want to talk about that. They don't want to talk about what their sin is. We don't want to deal with it. We want to kind of explain it. Well, I'm just, I'm just wired that way. It's just genetic. It's my dad's fault. You know, it's something like that. And I say, no, no, it's my fault. It's my fault. So in terms of unconfessed sin. So, so what if, remember I had the five M&M's, pack of M&Ms up here? So just what if Raleigh would have taken one of those? Like when I walked over here and I was over here like looking at, at Tamara and as I look back and Raleigh's like whoo, 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 stuffing some in her pockets. Uh-oh. Is she pulling some out of her pockets? You didn't steal, did you? Because then if you stole it and owned up to it, then you lied. No. Uh, so as I, as I envisioned this, I thought, what if Raleigh had done that? If she had stolen M&Ms from me I asked her about it. She said, no, Pastor Matt. So then she lied about it. She's sitting down there, and this whole time I'm thinking, I want to bless her, but I can't trust her. Because what if I then have like like a whole truckload, like a big old semi of M&Ms out here? And I'm like, okay, I need somebody to manage those M&Ms, but I can't trust Raleigh. She couldn't even walk off the stage without stealing from me and then lying about it. And if that had happened... That's why I'd say, Raleigh, you got anything to say? And I'd pass the microphone down there, and she'd say, is this on? It's on? Okay, Pastor Matt, yeah, I I did steal some M&Ms. I confessed that. I will not do it again. Literally, she confessed it, repented of it, and I'd say, wow, we're back in right standing. That's what God wants with you. To cut out this crop failure where you're saying, God, I'm sowing. Why am I not reaping? He said, because of unconfessed sin. And you're like, ooh, that's, that's kind of painful. It is painful, but you understand, God is looking for a person, a teenager, an adult, a senior citizen, who will say, God, this matters enough to me that our relationship is in right standing that I will pull out 
and talk about unconfessed sin in my life, and I will turn from it. And God says, I can work in that. Well, the last one is, it's a little bit interesting because uh, some of these you're going to laugh at, but I want you to think differently as a result of point number four. And point number four in crop failure is words. It's words because in our life, many times people use words so flippantly that they have no idea that they are canceling the work of God. You're like, wait a second, I don't understand this. Because let, let's say here, like, like with Raleigh again, like if I was getting ready to bless her, and I'm like, okay, guys, bring in the trucks. We got the M&Ms. It's like you know, big old barrels of them. And she's down here, and she's like, Daddy, that Pastor Matt, man, he, he is so annoying how he does that. He does that with the M&Ms, and he took them away from me. And you know, just my luck. If I, had, if, I, man, if I didn't have bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. And I'd be like, wait a second. Is that, I, I, you're like canceling the blessing I was about to bring to you by your words. And you're like, no, nah, it's just words. You know, sticks and stones, all stuff. No, no. Words matter. Don't miss this. This is so important. Okay, now here's, here's some of the phrases. T- take a look at some of these phrases. Okay, so, so read that to me. I mean, read it like something happened to your week and you're like, just my luck. Okay, has anybody said that this year? You've heard it. You've said it. You've seen it. Why don't you understand? Okay, did anybody in here last night sleep in a bed? Raise your hand if you slept in a bed underneath a roof with a kitchen full of food. Okay, I mean, I'm thinking if we're talking luck, that's some pretty good luck. That's some pretty good luck that you live in America and have a roof and have food and have a car and have people that love you. What, what do you mean just your luck? This is a perspective issue that we might joke about, <laughs> just my luck. Because like the next one here, if uh, my family or I didn't have bad luck, we wouldn't have any luck at all. Oh, man, I see. I've, I've heard this the last couple of weeks. It's so funny. People didn't know I was, I was preparing for this. I hear people talking and like, huh. I think of my car, man, if I, didn't have any bad, if I didn't have bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. And I was like, wait, wait, wait a second. Didn't your car park at a house? Didn't your house have food? Didn't you have shelter last night? And you live in a free country, and don't you have people that love you? And that's, that's, a, that's a run of bad luck? Is it really? Because I think what God wants is people are going to say, no, actually, my, my words are going to build up. They're not going to say, oh, man, the way to have the M&M thing again. If I had a pastor that really loved me, Man, he wouldn't do that to me. And hey, whether you're joking or not, your words are coming out. How about, uh, how about this one? Murphy's Law. Okay, anybody ever said Murphy's Law? And if you're young, like, I don't know. What is Murphy's Law? Don't write it down. By all means, let's read it and then throw it away. Because Murphy's Law basically what's saying, if, if anything can go wrong, it will. I mean, that kind of the gist of it. And I admit, sometimes I've had something go wrong. I'm like, Murph, no. No. Because you know what you're doing? You're actually calling out a curse. You're calling out a curse. You're like, okay, God, oh, this whole Panther situation, man, if it, if it could go wrong, it will. And now he's wearing scarves and everything, and now he's hurt, and he's out. we got Cardinals fans over here, and they're wearing jerseys, and we're like, see, see, it's just all going wrong. <laughs> and we laugh about football, but when it happens to us this week, and you're like, oh, that's great. Sure, the water heater. Yeah, if it could have gone wrong, it went wrong. Oh, traffic. Oh, that person cut me off. Oh, you understand what you're doing is you're perpetuating thoughts and then words in your life that literally are spinning curses. To where God's saying, no, no, I, I want somebody who's looking at this saying, what kind of good things are going to happen my day today? What kind of good things can I do today? How am I blessed today? God is doing amazing things in this world. I want to see those things. That is the kind of word processes God wants. I think I got another one up here. Oh, yeah. My, uh, I used to have a family member that when she, when she worked, and I'd go see her, and I was like, hey, how's your week been? How, how was today? And she was like, another day, another dollar. And, and okay, here, here's my thought on this. If I have an employee that works for me, and they say another day, another dollar like that, I say, well, how do we find you another place to go earn a dollar? Okay? Because the ability to have health and go work, that's a blessing. The ability to have a job in a free country and earn a paycheck and choose how you want to spend it, that's a blessing. And if you just go through your day and go through your week and you get to the end of it and you're like, oh, those people over there, man, another day, another dollar. What kind of gratitude is that? Is that possibly canceling what God wants to do through you and your job, through the money you're bringing in, through the money you're saving, through the the process he's working in you to sow and reap? 
Okay, and oh, oh then here, here's a great one. Last one. All right, read, read that to me. Okay, that better be the last time I hear you say that. Okay, because if I'm talking to you and you're like, oh, Pastor Matt, man, my temper this week, oh, the devil made me do it. I'm like, wait, 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 wait a second. Why are you giving him, him any authority in your life? Why are you speaking of him with any power, with any authority, with any credit? You understand, our Savior defeated him at Calvary and come out of the grave. So we will not even joke about the devil having power to make you do something. And if you're like, huh, it's just kind of funny. No, it's not. Because if Raleigh's down there and she's like showing her dad like pockets of M&Ms and like, look, daddy, the devil made me do it. And, 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 and the man's like, what is going on with our daughter? And I'm thinking, okay, I can't trust her with anything of value. You're thinking, Pastor Matt, that's pretty extreme. I'm just telling you, think about your words. And as a little bonus, this is a freebie to you. Because one of my favorite things that I have seen, words that make me think. I don't know if you ever uh, eat up at North Star in Dallas. But one of my favorite things is I'm checking out there that they have a sign up on the wall that says, I used to complain that I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. And every time I walk out of there thinking, I need to think like that. I need to think positive and not the devil made me do it or another day, another dollar or just my luck. I need to put things in my mind and words out of my mouth that are positive, that are not canceling the blessings of God. So this part four about words, let me give you a couple verses. I'm going to wrap this up. Proverbs 10, 19, it says, Sin is not ended by multiplying words, but the prudent hold their tongues. So let's be real for a minute. This is like group confession. Have your words ever got you in trouble? <laughs> oh, man, I got two hands on that. I got ten fingers on that. And I'm like, okay. I, it's almost like a cart going down a hill, and it's kind of going, and it's going faster, and it's faster, and it's like, all I need to just do right now is just shut up. <laughs> like, don't say anything else, because my words are getting me more and more and more in trouble. I'm telling you. Try to have self-control over your words. It, it will automatically cut out some problems in your life. And it will stop canceling the blessings of God. Proverbs 21, 23, those who guard their mouths and their tongues keep themselves from calamity. If you're in here today and you don't believe Jesus and don't believe the Bible or don't even like me, at least take this verse and say, okay, this week I'm going to guard my mouth more. And you just see if life gets better for you if you guard your mouth more. You can read these this week, but I'll tell you two quick stories in the Bible. In, in the book of Joshua, you know that story where those guys walked around the, the Jericho and they did it day after day for six days, and then seventh day the walls came down? You will look in there and see how they were given instructions to not talk. Serious. Go read the story. And you'll see on day seven, that's when you shout. And until then, it said, tell them, keep their mouth shut. You know why? I think this is why. Because if we all get up and start walking around a circle day after day after day, somebody's going to start grumbling. Why are we walking? Why are we doing this? Did Pastor Matt really say to do this? How many times? My feet hurt. Is this the right thing? Boy, it's hot out here. Is this going to work? We can't take that city. And what you're doing is you are canceling out the power of God. And literally, God said to Joshua, tell him to be quiet. Just if anything, just to shut up so they don't cancel my blessing. Because I think, honestly, they'd have walked around, got to day seven, and all went over, and God said, just turn around and go home. And we would not have had the walls of Jericho coming down. The second one, it's in your takeaway card, a story of this guy named Jairus. And he had a daughter who had died. And they're like, Jesus, get in here and find this girl. She, she's dead. And, they, and, and he comes on in, and everybody's wailing. And they should be sad. I understand that. But when Jesus came in, the Son of God, with all power and all creation, his disposal, walks in. He's like, hey, she's not dead. And they're like, shut up, man. You're so stupid. She's dead. No, no, no. She's going to be okay. No, he, no, she's not going to be okay. What do you think? And all this chatter starts, all this chatter, to where Jesus says, get them out of here. I can't work with that in here. So make sure you understand. If you're chattering, it, it cancels that blessing. The good news is, Raleigh, you didn't chatter. As far as I can tell, you don't have any unconfessed sin. That's good. You've been patient, and, and I sense you believe me. There's not like this lack of unbelief. So, wow. Oh, man, family size. Family size. Riley, this is for you, girl. I mean, like, literally, this is for you. You don't have to pass it out. You don't have to share it with your parents, your brother and sister, nobody. It's up to you, but that's yours. Let's hear it for Riley because she did. And so with Riley, she did not experience crop failure. She experienced a harvest. 
And somebody's new to vision, you're like, why is this guy using M&Ms for props? Because you're going to remember that. Two, three days, two, three weeks from now, you're not going to remember some of these things I said, but you're going to remember Raleigh walking off here with M&Ms because she did not experience crop failure. So in your lives, I want you to experience a harvest, not crop failure. So some next steps on that. Stop canceling God's blessings. As we move forward as a church, as you have a chance to give, as you have a chance to serve and invite people, as you have a chance in your life to grow in health and to mend relationships, all these things that God wants to do, stop canceling his blessings with your words. It really can be that simple. Another next step is to know and claim God's promises. Because as we've been talking for weeks now about taking God's word and personalizing it, when you speak it out loud, when you speak it in the first person, you are claiming God's promises and totally opposite of canceling, you are now multiplying his power when you use your words for gain. So we got that full bag of M&Ms. As we wrap this up, I want you to understand. You have access to reaping hundredfold. We talked about this last week massive potential of reaping after you sow. I don't want you to miss that in those relationships, in your health. If you're, if you're stressed and you're like, God, I want, I want victory over my stress, then you walk this path. Remember last week I gave you some pills and someone said, Matt, why don't you give them organic supplements? I said, I don't know, pills, supplements. You use what you want to. You take God's word, put it in soil, and you will see something. You'll reap out of it. When you don't have lack of faith, when you're not impatient, when truly you're walking with God in a way that says, God, okay, I'm going to trust you in this. My words are not going to cancel this out. You walk that path, and you will not experience crop failure.